This training program is designed to provide a good understanding of blood-borne pathogens, common modes of their transmission, methods of prevention, and other pertinent information. A copy of your company's blood-borne pathogen exposure control program is available for your review upon request from your supervisor. Bloodborne pathogens training is required if you can reasonably anticipate facing contact with blood and or other potentially infectious materials as part of your job duties. You should receive additional training from your instructor or supervisor, including an opportunity for interactive questions and answers. All healthcare facilities require bloodborne pathogens training and exposure plans, but there are a wide range of other facilities, including industrial nurses, first aid providers, emergency responders, and others who may come in contact with blood or potentially infectious materials. Bloodborne pathogens are microorganisms such as viruses or bacteria that are carried in blood and can cause disease in people. There are many different bloodborne pathogens, including malaria, syphilis, and brucellosis. But hepatitis B or HBV and the human immunodeficiency virus or HIV are the two diseases specifically addressed by the OSHA bloodborne pathogen standard. We also will provide information about hepatitis C, another bloodborne pathogen that has no cure. In the United States, approximately 300,000 people are infected with HBV annually. Of these cases, small percentages are fatal. Hepatitis means inflammation of the liver, and as its name implies, Hepatitis B is a virus that infects the liver. While there are several different types of hepatitis, hepatitis B is transmitted primarily through blood-to-blood -blood contact. Hepatitis B initially causes inflammation of the liver, but it can lead to more serious conditions such as cirrhosis and liver cancer. There is no cure or specific treatment for HBV, but many people who contract the disease will develop antibodies which help them get over the infection and protect them from getting it again. The hepatitis B virus is very durable and it can survive in dried blood for up to seven days. For this reason, this virus is the primary concern for employees such as housekeepers, custodians, laundry personnel, and other employees who may come in contact with blood or potentially infectious materials in a non-first aid or medical care situation. Hepatitis B is, um, as opposed to hepatitis A, is actually a blood-borne pathogen that is passed through either blood-to-blood -blood contact or through uh, sexual exposure. And there are about 400 million people in the world with hepatitis B, uh, and most of those people are from areas uh, in, the, in, in Asia, Africa, and, um, and in many third world countries. And chronic hepatitis B is a big problem because when somebody's born to a mother with hepatitis B, if they don't get the proper treatment when they're born, they actually have about an 80% chance of developing chronic infection that usually lasts forever. Adults who acquire hepatitis B either from blood transfusion sexually or through sharing needles and exposure that way or needle sticks in the hospital or healthcare setting have a less than 1% chance of developing chronic hepatitis B, but they are at risk for developing acute liver failure. So for anybody who is at high risk for developing, for, for getting hepatitis B, such as healthcare workers who may have needle stick injuries, um, people who, are, who, who have sex with, sex with multiple partners, especially gay men who have sex with multiple partners should all be vaccinated, and the vaccine helps protect against infection. But once somebody has chronic hepatitis B, the, the, the vaccine has no use. AIDS, or Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, is caused by a virus called the Human Immunodeficiency Virus, or HIV. Once a person has been infected with HIV, it may be many years before AIDS actually develops. HIV attacks the body's immune system, weakening it so it cannot fight other deadly diseases. AIDS is a fatal disease, and while treatment for it is improving, there is no known cure. The HIV virus is very fragile and it will not survive very long outside of the human body. It is primarily of concern to employees providing first aid or medical care in situations involving fresh blood or other potentially infectious materials. Because it is such a devastating disease, all precautions must be taken to avoid exposure. Uh, HIV can affect the liver um, in many ways. First of all, it can primarily affect the liver and, and actually cause um, HIV infection of the liver which often occurs at the time of an acute infection with HIV. 
However, the most common problem with the liver is related to effects on how the liver handles drugs that people take for HIV infection. For instance, if people have hepatitis C and HIV, not only does the hepatitis C disease progress much more quickly, but it also can affect the way the liver metabolizes drugs and make it impossible for people to take their medications because of liver toxicity from the medications. Um, hepatitis C is common in people with HIV who got HIV through blood to blood contact. Most people with HIV, mo most people in this country with hemophilia have HIV, especially the, the people who were getting blood products before the early 1990s. And many of those people also have hepatitis C and many of those people also have hepatitis B because of exposure to, um, to, the same, to those viruses through the same transfusion of products. Hepatitis C is a blood-borne infection caused by an RNA virus, hepatitis C virus, or HCV. This virus causes damage to the liver that may result in chronic infection and disease. HCV is unrelated to any of the other known hepatitis viruses, A, B, D, and E, and infection is identified by the detection of antibodies to the virus in the blood. Unlike many other infections, the presence of antibodies in the blood does not signify recovery. Over 85% of infected individuals fail to clear the virus spontaneously and develop chronic infections. Worldwide, some 170 million people are chronically infected with HCV, with almost 3 million of them in the United States. The Institute of Medicine classifies hepatitis C as an emerging infectious disease. There is no known cure for hepatitis C. Symptoms of liver damage may not be apparent for several years, and unfortunately, by the time serious liver disease is diagnosed, the liver damage can be considerable and even irreversible, often resulting in end-stage liver disease, cirrhosis, and primary liver cancer. Hepatitis C is a blood-borne infection caused by an RNA virus, hepatitis C virus, HCV. Hepatitis C is a virus that is passed similarly to hepatitis B. It's passed through blood contact, rarely through sexual uh, contact, although it can be. And um, people that share needles and people who had blood transfusions before the early 1990s are at great risk for actually having hepatitis C. And it affects the liver by causing usually, usually inflammation of the liver with chronic scarring of the liver. And people who, who have hepatitis C are at risk for developing cirrhosis after many, many years, usually 20 years after exposure. This virus causes damage to the liver that may result in chronic infection and disease. HCV is unrelated to any of the other known hepatitis viruses, A, B, D, and E, and infection is identified by the detection of antibodies to the virus in the blood. Unlike many other infections, the presence of antibodies in the blood does not signify recovery. Over 85% of infected individuals fail to clear the virus spontaneously and develop chronic infections. Viruses can't be seen by the eye or even under a microscope. It takes an electron microscope to see them. Worldwide, some 170 million people are chronically infected with HCV, with almost 4 million of them in the United States. There are an estimated 3.9 million Americans affected with hepatitis C, of whom 2.7 million have chronic hepatitis C, 75% of which have no idea they're infected and capable of transmitting the disease to others. About 85% of infected adults would develop chronic or long-lasting hepatitis C infections. To put these numbers in perspective, that's more than three times those infected with HIV or the virus that causes AIDS. HIV is spread when blood or body fluids from an infected person enter the body of a person who is not infected. The Institute of Medicine classifies hepatitis C as an emerging infectious disease. Hepatitis C is serious for some persons, but not for others. Most persons who get hepatitis C carry the virus for the rest of their lives. Most of these persons have some liver damage, but many do not feel sick from the disease. Some persons with liver damage due to hepatitis C may develop cirrhosis or scarring of the liver and liver failure, which may take many years to develop. Bloodborne pathogens such as HBV, HCV, and HIV can be transmitted through contact with infected human blood and other potentially infectious body fluids such as semen, vaginal secretions, cerebral spinal fluid, 
synovial fluid, pleural fluid, peritoneal fluid, amniotic fluid, saliva, such as in dental procedures, and any body fluid that is visibly contaminated with blood. It is important to know the ways exposure and transmission are most likely to occur in your particular situation, whether it is providing first aid to an individual in an emergency, handling blood samples in the laboratory, or cleaning up blood from a hallway. HBV, HCV, and HIV are most commonly transmitted through sexual contact, sharing of hypodermic needles, from mothers to their babies at or before birth, accidental puncture from contaminated needles, broken glass, or other sharps, contact between broken or damaged skin and infected body fluids, contact between mucous membranes and infected body fluids. Accidental puncture from contaminated needles and other sharps can result in transmission of blood-borne pathogens. Anytime there is a blood-to-blood -blood contact with infected blood or body fluids, there is a slight potential for transmission. Unbroken skin forms an impervious barrier against blood-borne pathogens. However, infected blood can enter your system through open sores, cuts, abrasions, acne, any sort of damaged or broken skin, such as sunburn or blisters. Blood-borne pathogens may also be transmitted through the mucous membranes of the eyes, nose, mouth. For example, a splash of contaminated blood to your eye, nose, or mouth could result in transmission. It is extremely important to use personal protective equipment and work practice controls to protect yourself from blood-borne pathogens. Universal precautions, also known as standard precautions, is the name used to describe a prevention strategy in which all blood and potentially infectious materials are treated as if they are, in fact, infectious, regardless of the perceived status of the source individual. In other words, whether or not you think the blood or body fluid is infected with blood-borne pathogens, you treat it as if it is. This approach is used in all situations where exposure to blood or potentially infectious materials is possible. Probably the first thing to do in any situation where you may be exposed to blood-borne pathogens is to ensure you are wearing the appropriate personal protective equipment, or PPE. For example, you may have noticed that emergency medical personnel, doctors, nurses, dentists, dental assistants, and other healthcare professionals always wear latex or protective gloves. This is a simple precaution they take in order to prevent blood or potentially infectious body fluids from coming in contact with their skin. To protect yourself, it is essential to have a barrier between you and the potentially infectious material. Rules to follow. Always wear personal protective equipment in exposure situations. Remove PPE that is torn or punctured or has lost its ability to function as a barrier to blood-borne pathogens. Replace PPE that is torn or punctured. Remove PPE before leaving the work area. If you work in an area with routine exposure to blood or potentially infectious materials, the necessary PPE should be readily accessible. Contaminated gloves, clothing, PPE or other materials should be placed in appropriately labeled bags or containers until it is disposed of, decontaminated, or laundered. It is important to find out where these bags or containers are located in your area before beginning your work. Gloves should be made of latex, nitrile, rubber, or other water impervious materials. If glove material is thin or flimsy, double gloving can provide an additional layer of protection. Also, if you know you have cuts or sores on your hands, you should cover these with a bandage or similar protection as an additional precaution before donning your gloves. You should always inspect your gloves for tears or punctures before putting them on. If a glove is damaged, don't use it. When taking contaminated gloves off, do so carefully. Make sure you don't touch the outside of the gloves with any bare skin and be sure to dispose of them in a proper container so that no one else will come in contact with them either. Anytime there is a risk of splashing or vaporization of contaminated fluids, goggles and or other eye protection should be used to protect your eyes. Again, blood-borne pathogens can be transmitted through the thin membranes of the eyes, so it is important to protect them. Splashing could occur while cleaning up a spill, during laboratory procedures, or while providing first aid or medical assistance. Face shields may be worn in addition to goggles to provide additional face protection. 
A face shield will protect against splashes to the nose and mouth. Aprons may be worn to protect your clothing and to keep blood or other contaminated fluids from soaking through to your skin. Normal clothing that becomes contaminated with blood should be removed as soon as possible because fluids can seep through the cloth to come in contact with skin. Contaminated laundry should be handled as little as possible and it should be placed in an appropriately labeled bag or container until it is decontaminated, disposed of, or laundered. Remember to use universal precautions and treat all blood or potentially infectious body fluids as if they are contaminated. Avoid contact whenever possible, and whenever it's not, wear personal protective equipment. If you find yourself in a situation where you have to come in contact with blood or other body fluids and you don't have any standard personal protective equipment handy, you can improvise. Use a towel, plastic bag, or some other barrier to help avoid direct contact. Hand washing is one of the most important and easiest practices used to prevent transmission of bloodborne pathogens. Hands or other exposed skin should be thoroughly washed as soon as possible following an exposure incident. Use soft, antibacterial soap if possible. Avoid harsh, abrasive soaps as these may open fragile scabs or other sores. Hands should also be washed immediately or as soon as feasible after removal of gloves or other personal protective equipment. Because hand washing is so important, you should familiarize yourself with the location of the hand washing facilities nearest to you. Laboratory sinks, public restrooms, janitor closets, and so forth may be used for hand washing if they are normally supplied with soap. If you are working in an area without access to such facilities, you may use an antiseptic cleanser in conjunction with clean cloth or paper towels or antiseptic towelettes. If these alternative methods are used, hands should be washed with soap and running water as soon as possible. If you are working in an area where there is reasonable likelihood of exposure, you should never eat, drink, smoke, apply cosmetics or lip balm, handle contact lenses. No food or drink should be kept in refrigerators, freezers, shelves, cabinets, or on countertops where blood or potentially infectious materials are present. All surfaces, tools, equipment, and other objects that come in contact with blood or potentially infectious materials must be decontaminated and sterilized as soon as possible. Equipment and tools must be cleaned and decontaminated before servicing or being put back to use. Decontamination should be accomplished by using a solution of 5.25% sodium hypochlorite or household bleach diluted between 1 to 10 and 1 to 100 with water. The standard recommendation is to use at least a quarter cup of bleach per one gallon of water. Lysol or some other EPA-registered tuberculocytal disinfectant. Check the label of all disinfectants to make sure they meet this requirement. If you are cleaning up a spill of blood, you can carefully cover the spill with paper towels or rags, then gently pour the 10% solution of bleach over the towels or rags and leave it for at least 10 minutes. This will help ensure that any blood-borne pathogens are killed before you actually begin cleaning or wiping the material up. By covering the spill with paper towels or rags, you decrease the chances of causing a splash when you pour the bleach on it. If you are decontaminating equipment or other objects such as scalpels, microscope slides, broken glass, saw blades, tweezers, mechanical equipment upon which someone has been cut, first aid boxes or other contaminated equipment, you should leave the disinfectant in place for at least 10 minutes before continuing the cleaning process. Of course, any materials you use to clean up a spill of blood or potentially infectious materials must be decontaminated immediately as well. This would include mops, sponges, reusable gloves, buckets, pails, etc. Far too frequently, housekeepers, custodians, and others are punctured or cut by improperly disposed needles and broken glass. This, of course, exposes them to whatever infectious material may have been on the glass or needle. For this reason, it is especially important to handle and dispose of all sharps carefully in order to protect yourself as well as others. Needles must be disposed of in sharps containers. Improperly disposed needles can injure housekeepers, custodians, and other people. Needles should never be recapped. Needles should be moved only by using a mechanical device or tool such as forceps, pliers, or broom and dustpan. Never break or shear needles. Needles shall be disposed of in labeled sharps containers only. Sharps containers shall be closable, puncture resistant, leak proof on sides and bottom, and must be labeled or color coded. 
When Sharps containers are being moved from the area of use, the container should be closed immediately before removal or replacement to prevent spillage or protrusion of contents during handling or transport. Broken glassware that has been visibly contaminated with blood must be sterilized with an approved disinfectant solution before it is disturbed or cleaned up. Glassware that has been decontaminated may be disposed of in an appropriate Sharps container. For example, closable, puncture resistant, leak proof on sides and bottom with appropriate labels. Broken glassware will not be picked up directly with the hands. Sweep or brush the material into a dustpan. Uncontaminated broken glassware may be disposed of in a closable, puncture resistant container such as a cardboard box or coffee can. By using universal or standard precautions and following these simple engineering and work practice controls, you can protect yourself and prevent transmission of bloodborne pathogens. Warning labels need to be affixed to containers of regulated waste, refrigerators and freezers containing blood or other potentially infectious materials, and other containers used to store, transport, or ship blood or other potentially infectious materials. These labels are fluorescent orange, red, or orange red. Bags used to dispose of regulated waste must be red or orange red and they too must have the biohazard symbol readily visible upon them. Regulated waste should be double bagged to guard against the possibility of leakage if the first bag is punctured. Labels should display the universal biohazard symbol. Regulated waste refers to any liquid or semi-liquid blood or other potentially infectious materials. Contaminated items that would release blood or other potentially infectious materials in a liquid or semi-liquid state if compressed. Items that are caked with dried blood or other potentially infectious materials and are capable of releasing these materials during handling. All regulated waste must be disposed of in properly labeled containers or red biohazard bags. These must be disposed at an approved facility. All bags, whether they are regulated or non-regulated waste containing such materials, must be labeled, signed, and dated, verifying that the materials inside have been decontaminated according to acceptable procedures and pose no health threat. Custodians and housekeepers will not remove bags containing any form of blood or vials containing blood, bloody towels, rags, biohazardous waste, etc., from laboratories unless the bag has one of these labels on it. They have been given very strict instructions not to handle any non-regulated waste unless it has been properly marked and labeled with a signature. Custodians should never handle regulated waste. In an emergency situation involving blood or potentially infectious materials, you should always use universal precautions and try to minimize your exposure by wearing gloves, splash goggles, pocket mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation masks, and other barrier devices. If you are exposed, however, you should 1. Wash the exposed area thoroughly with soap and running water. Use non-abrasive antibacterial soap if possible. If blood is splashed in the eye or mucous membrane, flush the affected area with running water for at least 15 minutes. 2. Report the exposure to your supervisor as soon as possible. 3. Fill out an exposure report form. This form will be kept in your personnel file for 40 years so that you can document workplace exposure to hazardous substances. 4. You may also request blood testing for the hepatitis B vaccination if you have not already received it. Employees who have routine exposure to bloodborne pathogens such as doctors, nurses, first aid responders, and similar occupations shall be offered the hepatitis B vaccine series at no cost to themselves unless they have previously received the vaccine series, antibody testing has revealed they are immune, the vaccine is contradicted for medical reasons. In these cases, they need not be offered the series. Although your employer must offer the vaccine to you, you do not have to accept that offer. You may opt to decline the vaccination series, in which case you will be asked to sign a declination form. Even if you decline the initial offer, you may choose to receive the series at any time during your employment thereafter, for example, if you are exposed on the job at a later date. If you are exposed to blood or potentially infectious materials on the job, you may request a hepatitis B vaccination at that time. If the vaccine is administered immediately after exposure, it is extremely effective at preventing the disease. The hepatitis B vaccination is given in a series of three shots. The second shot is given one month after the first, 
and the third shot follows five months after the second. This series gradually builds up the body's immunity to the hepatitis B virus. The vaccine itself is made from yeast cultures. There is no danger of contracting the disease from getting the shots, and once vaccinated, a person does not need to receive the series again. There are booster shots available, however, and in some instances these may be recommended, for example, if there is an outbreak of hepatitis B at a particular location. Medical records are to be retained for each employee with occupational exposure for the duration of employment plus 30 years. The records must be confidential and must include name and social security number, hepatitis B vaccination status, and results of any examinations, medical testing, and follow-up procedures, a copy of the healthcare professional's written opinion, and a copy of information provided to the healthcare professional. Training records must be maintained for three years and must include dates, contents of the training program or a summary, trainer's name and qualifications, names and job titles of all persons attending the sessions. You can see there are a variety of procedures and protocols to follow when working in a healthcare or healthcare related environment. These procedures are designed to protect all individuals from bloodborne pathogens. Know your plan, know your procedures, and follow them to the letter of the law. The risk of transmission is low, but the stakes are quite high. So do your part and stay safe and healthy.